Well, good morning, family. How are we doing today? Good. It's uh, yay. It's good to see you guys this morning. Um, this is my favorite time of year. Uh, the Christmas season, the Advent season is absolutely my favorite time. Christmas is just around the corner. Although the Worsham family has been ready since mid-November, we've taken criticism for it, for putting our lights up in early November. That's okay. You've judged me, and it's fine. I'm okay with that uh, because I love Christmas, and it's all right. Uh, but uh, I love Christmas time, and I'm so excited. We're starting uh, a brand new series today with quite possibly the most depressing intro we've ever had here at FCF, <laughs> How to Undo a Blue Christmas. My goodness, that was sad. Uh, so we're going to be talking about, so what is this uh, Undo a Blue Christmas all about? Man, hopefully it's about making us a little happier, man. That was, uh, that was really depressing. But uh, this series is going to be a series that's all about joy. And we're going to talk about joy and how to find joy even in the midst of difficulty and when things don't go your way and, and people aren't necessarily around you and you feel a little lonely. I mean, joy is, is what the Advent season really is all about, joy to the world. And at a time of year when a lot of people should feel joyful, and this is a time of year we should be joyful, let's be honest, at this time of year though, this is a time when many people don't feel joyful. This is where people experience the opposite of joy in their lives. And for many of us, we look forward to the holidays, but I know there are a large majority of people that really dread this time of year because it means loneliness or despair or there's depression or grief. There's that sense of this overwhelming just thing just sitting on top of us and setting in on us. And when it does, it's very easy for our dreams of a white Christmas to turn blue. And now that happens in a normal year. Right, where people don't kind of dread this season, and this season brings a lot of stress and anxiety and loneliness and depression to it in a normal year. Now, we have to understand this. 2020 has been not your prototypical normal year, right? It has been a very strange year, and now you add this year on top of what can be a time of year with a lot of stress and anxiety, a lot of struggle, a lot of suffering, a lot of loneliness. When you add that on top of it, this could be a year that a lot of people really feel blue. And so if there's ever been a year that is a candidate for a blue Christmas, I, I think this is the year because times are tough. Finances are tight. Some people have lost their jobs. There's been loss. There's been sickness. There's been death. There's uncertainty. There's anxiety. There's depression. There's division in our country and really in the world. We're experiencing a real mental health crisis that is going on. And so this is the world that we live in. And so I have to say this this morning as I describe that world and it, it kind of feels a little down. I want to tell you this powerful truth. That world I just described is the world that God steps into. Like this is the world that Jesus steps into where he becomes one of us and he draws close to us where we are in the middle of the mess, in the middle of the brokenness, right in our loneliness. Jesus comes near and he comes close to us. And so in John chapter 1, verse 1, John chapter 1 is probably one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, but it begins like this. It says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, it's not talking about this when it says that. It's not talking about the Word that wasn't around yet, right? But the Word is uh, the heart of who God is, the character of who God, everything that God is, is expressed in this Word, right? And it says, this Word, God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. Verse 4 says, the Word gave life to everything that was created, and nothing was created except through him, this word, right? And the word gave life, and it brought light to everyone. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And so there is this word, the fullness of who God is. Everything that God represents is encapsulated in this word. And so here's what we have to know. The fullness of God. Everything that God is, all the power of God and the love of God. Listen what happens down in verse 14. And it says, so this word became flesh, became human, and made his home among us. The fullness of God became human and made his home among us. Right in the middle of the mess. 
right into the brokenness of society and the world, made his home among us, and he, this word, was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, who is this word. This word is the man, Jesus. Jesus has come near. Jesus is the light of the world, and he has entered our darkness. And here's the good news, church. The darkness can never extinguish the light. The light is here, and he has made his home among us, even with darkness present, even with suffering present, even with struggles and anxiety present. Here's what we have to know. There is hope even in the darkness because the light has come. Peace has come. Hope is here. God is with us. The fullness of God is with us. It's at these times of year, I wish it was more, I try to do it often when I'm up here, to remind you of a title that is ascribed to Jesus. And we say it a lot during this time of year. We sang it just a moment ago, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel literally means God with us. God with us. That is who Jesus is. Jesus is God with us. And if the fullness of God's presence is with us, then that means that the fullness of joy is here. And if he is with us and he is for us, that means even in the darkness, even in the suffering and in the struggle, we can experience joy. And and I want you to know this. God wants you, God wants me to live with joy joy. I think it's possible to have joy even as you suffer. I think it's possible to have joy even when things don't go your way because here's what you have to know about joy. Joy is not the absence of problems. Joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is the presence of God in the midst of our suffering. Joy is the presence of God in the midst of our struggles. And if he is with us, then the fullness of life is available to us. This is the hope of the world. This is good news that Jesus has come near. Now to find this joy, we're going to talk about joy all throughout this series, which I think is so appropriate. But to do so today, we're going to go to a place that's a little different than the traditional Christmas story. Although, don't worry, we will get there in due time together. We're going to go to the book of Philippians, Uh, And as we go there, we're going to get a little bit of context. We're going to start in chapter 1. But before we begin, uh, Paul has written a letter to this church, to this group of people gathered together in, in Philippi. And he actually founded this church in the year 52 A.D. I heard 52 A.D. was a great year for church planting. So he plants a church in 52 A.D. It was founded by Paul. And so he pens a letter Uh, to these people that he planted in Philippi, this church. And so uh, 10 years after the church is founded in 62 AD, Paul kind of writes this thank you letter. And what's a part of this thank you letter, he mentions thank you for the generous gift that has helped support the ministry, that has helped things to carry on. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to pass the plate. We're not going to take a Christmas offering at at this moment. Uh, But but Paul is thankful for these people. And you may be wondering, Pat, why in the world... Are we in the book of Philippians for Christmas time, right? And so I, you have to know this. The book of Philippians, it, it's kind of, kind of, it's a great book, but it's wild that this would be the book where you find a joy right in the middle of it. It's a place you wouldn't expect to find joy because in the 10 years from 52 AD to 62 AD, in those 10 years, a lot has changed in the world. A lot has changed in the life of Paul. And so here's what's changed in those 10 years. In those 10 years, Paul has been arrested in Rome. Paul is actually in chains, in captivity, in a dungeon as he writes the book or the letter of Philippians. And so Paul wrote Philippians from a Roman prison while awaiting a potential execution. Joy to the world. Right? I mean, this, it, it's not a place you would expect to find joy. According to Acts 28, we know that Paul was there for at least two years, awaiting potential execution in chains, 24 hours a day under Roman guard, a, a, a very, very cruel empire to be under if you weren't in the right spot or the right 
you were the right person. History tells us before his execution, before being beheaded in Rome, Paul was kept in, in what's, what's now known as Paul's maritime prison. It was this underground dungeon, dungeon kind of hewn or made out of rock. It had rock walls, a rock ceiling, a rock floor. It was a round room. It was 12 feet across, 6 feet as high as it was, and then it sloped down on the sides. Right in the middle of the prison or the dungeon, there was this stone pillar that came up with a metal hook like this, and that's where the chains would be. So he could be chained up, move around still, and there was a little indention made in it that would hold water, and then there was another hole kind of dug out over here for, you know, the feces and whatnot, like those kinds of things. And I'm sorry I just said that on Sunday morning, but uh, the restroom was right over there in in the corner. I apologize for that. Um, And so this is the setting for what most biblical scholars agree what the book of Philippians or the letter to the Philippians is all about, joy. Paul writes about the fullness of joy chained up in a Roman dungeon awaiting his execution. It doesn't seem like a very joyful occasion to me. That's probably not what I would be writing. I would be writing my lawyer, right? I would be writing the emperor or the governor or the local magistrate. Like I would be writing all of these people to try to get out of here, Paul is focused on one thing, even in chains, encouraging these people that can have full joy. Joy is the theme of the book of Philippians. Paul tells them to rejoice seven times. On six occasions, he talks about the fullness of joy with chains on his wrist awaiting his execution. And you have to ask the question that I ask. How is it possible that Paul has this attitude? How is it possible that Paul has this perspective of joy? And not just even concerned about his own joy, but really about the joy of the people that he is concerned about and loves. How could you write about joy and have joy in the midst of suffering when life doesn't go your way? This is what we hope to discover together in this series. Now, if you were to read the first 11 verses in the first chapter of Philippians, you would find it front-loaded with thank yous. Like, Paul is an attitude of gratitude. That's not what we're going, but he is thankful for the people that are in his life and that are in uh, this church that he has planted. And you see just how much Paul loves these people. And so we're going to begin in verse 12 with an interesting verse, with an interesting perspective, and it reads this way. Now, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Think about that statement. Think about Paul's current situation. Think about where he is, how he's writing. He's in chains waiting for execution, and this is what he says. I want you to know that what has happened to me wasn't a travesty of justice, right? He doesn't defend himself. He just says this, this situation has really helped to serve to advance the gospel. Paul relates his present suffering and difficulties simply as a means to advance the gospel. That God would use the place that he's in, even the circumstance that he finds himself in, to advance the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll say this for me. That's a powerful perspective. That is a life-altering perspective. That's a way, of course, you can find joy in any situation if this is the attitude that you have. And I want to encourage us to move towards that because let's be honest, we all live life and we know this. Life is not always easy. Life does not always go the way that you want it to go. Life is not always peaches and cream. Life is not always a bowl of cherries. Life is not always a skip through a field of daisies or a bed of roses or whatever metaphor you can plug in right there. Life doesn't always go our way. In fact, not every day is a good day, is it? We're in church. You can be honest. Not every day is a good day. Sometimes the day is hard. Sometimes there are bad weeks. Sometimes there are bad months. Not that all 30 days are bad, but when a few are bad, it kind of overshadows the rest, doesn't it? The negative has a way of overshadowing so so much. Some we have bad weeks and months, and sometimes we have bad years. That's what this year feels like. Like, it's difficult. These things happen. 2020 is almost over, and most of us are glad because, and I'll say this for me, Here's why I'm glad 2020 is almost over. 
I'm tired. I'm weary. And I know what you're thinking. Pat, you work one day a week for an hour, right? You're doing it right now. How can you be tired and weary? The things we've walked through together. Vision that's happened in our country and society. It's, it's even leaked down into where we are. And just like you, I'm, I'm tired. And I'm weary. And I know you are tired and you're weary with everything that's weighing down. And often in the middle of our tired and weary, especially when times are not going the way that we want them to go, there's usually a question we ask towards God or just in general when things aren't going the way that we want to go. And and we're tired and we're weary and we just want to move on. And the question all of us have probably asked this year when things happen, bad things happen, we usually ask this question. Does anybody know what the question is? Why? Why? Like, why? God, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? Why is this going on? And if you ask the question why, the question why can be a frustrating question because often when we ask the question why, usually there's not an answer to that question, is there? Sometimes we just don't know what the answer to the question is of why. Now, I have to say this. If anybody had a right to ask the question why, I think it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul was in prison not for stealing things or murdering people. Paul was in prison for proclaiming the love of Jesus to the world. What a crime, right? But unfortunately, truly proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom of God, sometimes sets itself up against the empire in which we live. And sometimes when you proclaim that gospel in a bold way, it goes against the ways of Of the world. And this had landed Paul in some hot water because for them to say Jesus is Lord was to say that Caesar ultimately was not Lord, which was very dangerous to do. And Paul finds himself in prison for being very allegiant to Jesus. And if anybody could ask why, it was Paul. But Paul doesn't ask that question because Paul knows there's probably not a really good answer for it. There's probably not an answer for it. At all, and I want to tell you why. There's an answer to this why. I want to tell you why it's not a good idea to ask the question why, especially when there's not an answer for it. Because when we ask the question why and there's not an answer for it, we want an answer. And so, what we do in our minds, we fill in the gaps where there is no answer. And usually, what our minds fill in the gaps with are negative things. We fill in the gaps and we assume things. And when we put those answers there and they are negative, already on top of a negative situation, it sinks us lower and lower and lower and lower. So we can't ask the question why, especially when there is no answer for it. Because our minds will just fill in the gap, usually with negative things, and it will sink us lower. So if I could say this, why is a joy-stealing question. It's a joy-stealing question. When there is no answer to the question why, to just ponder on why sometimes can run you lower and lower. And so I would say this, to have joy no matter what you face in life, I just want to invite you to ask a different question. Just ask a better question. Maybe instead of asking why, maybe you can begin to just ask what. What? So 2020, pandemic, things are going crazy, unrest, division, stress, loss, sickness. Everything's happening. It seems like the world is on fire. We can look at this and say, why? And our minds can fill in the gaps with negative things to that question. Or we can look at it and we can say, what? God, what are you trying to show us through this? God, what are you doing to work in this? God, in what ways? Could you maybe use my life, work through my life to advance your kingdom even in this difficult situation that we're in? So maybe ask a different question. Maybe you could ask the question, what? Think about changing the question, asking a better question. And I want to ask you this. 
You hear me ask this question from time to time. Do you believe that Jesus is trustworthy? I hope for believers in Jesus, your answer is yes to that. Do you believe Jesus is trustworthy? Do you believe that Jesus really loves you? Do you believe Jesus really loves the world? And if you believe that Jesus is trustworthy, and you believe that Jesus does love you and love the world, then I would invite you to consider this powerful truth. Romans 8.28, and we know that in what? All things, we know that in all things, God works. In all things, God works for good. For the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The key word is all. So does that mean that God works in bad things? The answer is yes. Because God works in all things. And so maybe it's time we change our perspective and we ask a better question. If God is working, maybe when things don't go our way, we can say, God, what are you doing? God, what are you trying to show me? God, what would you have me do in this moment to advance your kingdom? And if we believe Jesus is trustworthy and he loves us the way that he says he loves us and has shown us, then I think we can trust him. And what does trusting him look like? Here's what trusting Jesus looks like. Trusting Jesus fleshed out looks like you following his way. That's what it means to trust Jesus. You follow his way. And what is the way of Jesus? He gives us one simple but demanding command, right? John 13, 34, a new command I give you, that you love one another in the manner Jesus says that I have loved you, so you must love one another. Even when things are bad, I would say, if you want to find joy, follow the way of Jesus. Follow him. If he's trustworthy and you believe he loves you, then follow his way. Because he is good and he does love us, even when things are difficult, you can always know this truth. God is working. He's always working. He's always up to something. And he's always working for good. Now here's the difficult part about that statement. Good to God and good to us can sometimes be different things, right? It can sometimes be different things. And so we must trust him and look for where he is working and what he is doing. I think this is what Paul did. God, what are you trying to show me? What do you want to accomplish? Not why and not have an answer and then sink lower and lower and lower, but God, what can I do? What are you doing? Philippians 1.12, Paul, again, this is what he says in his situation. I want you to know that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. That word advance, it means this. It means a pioneer advance, like a new expedition, blazing a new trail. Paul has an opportunity to blaze a new trail even in his difficult circumstance, right? It means the progress of an army or an expedition, right? It means that we take new ground, and obviously, we don't take that ground violently. The way of Jesus isn't violent. But we take new ground. We advance the gospel no matter what is in front of us because we have seen what Jesus has done. And so what has Jesus come to do? When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, why did he come to the earth? Why did he come here? John 3.16, I think, gives us a very simple explanation for that. John 3.16 says, For God so loved right for God so loved the world <laughs> my goodness you're so excited for God so loved the world that he sent his son he gave his one and only son Jesus and he came to this earth that none would perish but all would have life to the full eternal life and Jesus didn't come to this world verse 17 tells us like, like verse 17 I feel like gets neglected a lot in John 3 16 All right Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world but rather to save the world through himself like that is powerful and so the mission of Jesus when he came to this earth was to simply do this was to save the world and here's an interesting question how did Jesus save the world 
I want to offer you this. Here's how Jesus saved the world, through self-giving, self-sacrificing, co-suffering love. That's how Jesus changed the world. That's how Jesus saved the world, through self-giving, self-sacrificing, co-suffering love. Now, let me ask you this question. How do you think we will save the world? How do you think we will shape the world? How do you think we will advance the gospel and the kingdom of God? We have to do it the same way Jesus did it, which means we must be a people who reach this world through self-giving, self-sacrificing, co-suffering love. Or there's another way to put that as Jesus commands, to love others as he has loved us. This was the mission of Jesus. This is the mission he hands to Paul. Paul, as he says in 2 Corinthians 5, was an ambassador, right? An ambassador, a minister of reconciliation, a representative of Jesus to this world. And Paul doesn't draw his sword and fight the Romans that are trying to take him captive. What does Paul do? He gets arrested and he preaches the gospel where he is. Like, like that's powerful, This is how Paul sees his situation as a new opportunity to preach the gospel where he is, to see God work in a brand new way. And so Paul, by being a prisoner of Rome, right, because he was a prisoner in Rome, the message of the gospel had an opportunity to advance in a brand new way. Paul now had a new audience where he was to preach the gospel too. This was his attitude, and I think this is how he was able to find a little joy in his life. Instead of Paul saying, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why did I get arrested? Paul says, God, what are you trying to do in this moment? What are you trying to do through me? And Paul gets that perspective, and he preaches the gospel to the Roman guard and the people around him. And so there are two questions we need to ask. The first one is this, what? God, what are you doing? We need to change our perspective. And so he goes on in verse 13 before we get to the second question. Verse 13 of Philippians 1. He says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in in chains for Christ. How do you think the whole palace guard and everybody around him knows he's in chains for Christ? Because he'd be telling them about it, right? He's talking about Jesus where he is. It's a new opportunity. He's loving his enemies where he is. He says, because of my chains, me being arrested in a dungeon, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. People are inspired even as he is arrested and in chains because of his attitude and his bravery. People are inspired. And so you have to understand this. Please understand. Asking the right question, asking what, taking advantage of new opportunities, right? Having the right perspective or the right attitude. It's not going to make your problems go away. Because again, joy isn't the absence of problems. It's the awareness and recognition that the fullness of the presence of God is with you in the midst of your problems. That's joy. And Paul understands this. In verse 15, So some have been encouraged to speak the word more courageously. But then in verse 15, listen what happens. A new problem crops up. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy. That's not good, is it? Okay, no, it's not good. Some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others preach Christ out of goodwill. The latter, or those who preach Christ in goodwill, Do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, the ones preaching out of envy and rivalry to Paul, says, The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Paul, with a pure heart for the gospel, a pure heart for Jesus, with chains on his arms, has to deal with even more problems. And it's not from Roman people he has to deal with. It's from friendly fire, from from his own fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Even back then, people had to deal with division and disagreement. Paul experiences this. While he's in prison for Christ, people are saying he's doing it all for show. Like, what is wrong with people. That's the way I would be. What is wrong with people? People on the outside would preach Christ 
and then tear Paul down in the next breath, right? Supposing they could stir up trouble out of selfish ambition. Paul's like, here I am preaching my heart out, being tortured, waiting my execution, and I'm being criticized by my own family of believers. How nuts is that? For me, I have some phrases I would use that I won't use on a Sunday. From up here, the way I would feel, uh, that was a big time filter and growth spiritually for me that I didn't say it. Uh, it's not curse words, so don't worry, but uh, probably not nice. Um, but I wouldn't have that attitude Paul had. But what was his attitude? That they were preaching Christ and then tearing him down in the next breath. This is so powerfully convicting. And I think especially in our day and time, this can be so encouraging. And this can set us free. Like, I'm not kidding. This could set us free. This is so powerful. Not because I'm saying it, but because it's the words of God uh, given to us. So people are tearing Paul down. Look at what Paul says in verse 18. What's it matter? What's it matter? The important thing is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. What's it matter? If we're going to keep our joy, especially in this climate that we're in, we got to ask a better question than why. we got to ask what. But then the second question we must ask as a people of God is this. So what? So what? Like, like what, what does it matter? So what? We let so many little things steal our joy, don't we? So many things. And in the scope of eternity, is it worth that? Giving our joy away over little things? Now, if we're talking, if someone's preaching a gospel that says Jesus isn't Lord, we got issues, and we got to have a conversation. We let so many little things that in the scope of eternity steal our joy that this don't matter. We get caught up in it when people don't act right, when people don't talk right, when they don't think like us or look like us, when things don't go the way we want them to go, when life kind of veers away from the roadmap that we have planned for life we get so upset, and when we do, when we get upset and offended, here's what happens. It affects everything, everything, everything. The joy is just sucked right out of it. But Paul in prison wasn't going to let that happen. Like, they're criticizing Paul, like you guys, the Apostle Paul, criticizing him, questioning his motives, tearing him down. And you know what Paul says? Ah, so what? As long as Christ is preached, I take joy in that. It's beautiful. And it's freeing. I want to challenge you in this climate. This is how we can find joy. Even when things, especially when things are heated and difficult. Like when you want to get offended over something. And this is a day and time when we can get offended over something. It is. We need to ask a better question. So what? What does it matter? What's most important? That I'm right and everybody knows it, or that we get it right together? What's most important? And I have to say this. There's only one thing in life that you will ever be able to control. Newsflash. It's you. It's not everyone else. It's you. You are the only thing that you can control. You will never, ever, 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 ever be able to control everything outside of yourself. You won't. And so I would challenge you, stop trying to rule the world. Take care of you. Gain self-control. Say, so what? What's it matter? Christ is preached. That's what's most important.
when we are offended and we live in the offense, we're no good to ourselves, we're no good to others, we're no good to advancing the kingdom of God because we're caught up and consumed just in where we are. Our offense could cost us our joy. Think about if the Apostle Paul had truly taken offense at what people were saying about him while he was in prison. You realize the majority of the New Testament that Paul gave us came while he was in prison. And had he taken offense and gotten his, his underwear in a wad, we might not have these beautiful, powerful, gripping letters to people that were struggling in churches every day. When you hold on to offense, you lose your joy. You lose it. And Nehemiah 8.10 tells us, the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we forfeit our joy, we forfeit our strength. And we have no strength from the Lord and no joy from the Lord. We are open to everything that is around us because we're standing on our own and we're working in our own way, in our own power, in our own might. And we will never overcome in our own might. It's only in the joy and the strength of the Lord that we overcome. So whatever it costs us, Whatever we have to lay down, whatever we have to push aside, we do so to hold on to the joy of the Lord. Even with chains, with a golden opportunity to be angry, to be offended, to ask why. Paul doesn't ask those questions. Paul says, okay, God, what? What are you trying to do in this? What are you trying to do in me through this? What can I do to advance your kingdom. And then he said, people are criticizing me. So what? Ultimately, what does it matter? How does Paul get to that place? And I brought you all this way to the end of the message to really give you something that your socks will probably stay on your feet. You'll probably still sit there in your chair like this. You won't be on the edge of your seat. But I think it's a very simple, profound thing that we often neglect every single day day. I think Paul was able to ask the better question and find joy in suffering and difficulty because Paul ultimately knew what mattered most in life. Like he did. He knew what mattered most in life. He knew what he was on earth to do. And Philippians 1.21 kind of lays it out for us. He says this, for me to live is Christ." And to die is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. To use a church cliche, Paul knew that it's all about Jesus. And I think that's a cliche we need to adopt again. And not just say with our mouths, but live with our lives. That it is about Jesus. And if it's about Jesus, if it's truly about him, we need to follow the command he's given us. To love in the way that he has loved us. And if we love in the way he has loved us, and our focus is Jesus and the other person, I think joy kind of naturally comes to us even in difficulty because our perspective will be different. And I just want to challenge you today. Dare to believe that God is good no matter what. Dare to believe that God is good and dare to believe that Jesus loves you the way that he says he does. And if we truly grab on to that, everything, everything, everything changes. Everything changes.